So should we start? Oh, you're going to introduce us. Yes, and before you get started, Dr. Sagal is going to introduce you all. He'll read your bios and then hand it over to you. All right, Dr. Sagal, take it away. All right, one second. All right. I hope I have my voice on. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. All right. All right, I want to welcome everyone to the start of our 2024-2025 season for the Baltimore County Fire Department Emergency Medical Services uh, lecture series. Uh, we're going to start off the year in cardiac, and I have two special people to introduce to you. The first is Jennifer Young. Jennifer is an RN with over 25 years experience in cardiac care. After working in the cardiac cath lab for more than a decade, she transitioned into quality and STEMI management program coordinator. She currently serves as the nurse manager for the cardiac and the vascular services unit at St. Joseph's Medical Center a recognized leader in cardiovascular medicine in Maryland and a designated cardiac intervention center. Uh, she is joined by Dr. Daniel Ambender, a fellow of the American College of Cardiologists. He is an interventional and structural cardiologist at University of Maryland St. Joseph's Medical Center, which is part of the University of Maryland medical system. Uh, Dr. Ambender is a interventional structural cardiologist again at St. Joseph's. He has a passion for medical education. He co-founded Cardio Nerds. The website is on the screen, www.cardionerds.com. In his capacity, he's designed and maintains this website and has helped establish the Cardio Nerds Academy, narratives in cardiology, medical journalism, and scholarship programs. He received his medical degree from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and completed his residency at the Oscar program at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, where he's also completed his general cardiology interventional and structural heart fellowships. So without further ado, I'm going to bring us to Jennifer Young so we can get started. I want to welcome everybody. This should be a fantastic year. Thank you, Dr. Sagal, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. Ambender and I are, are very excited to, to be with you and, and share some of our knowledge um, with regards to cardiovascular medicine, specifically um, care of our STEMI patients, which are some of the most vulnerable population that we see um, and are really, um, really proud of our partnership with EMS. Um, so I wanted to start out with um, just talking about the, the STEMI chain of survival. Um, so this was, this was adapted by the American Heart Association and really summarizes four critical components um, to achieve early reperfusion. Obviously starts with the patient, early symptom recognition and call for help. We were out in the community frequently um, teaching um, our patients about the signs and symptoms of uh, myocardial infarction and encouraging them to call 911. Um, the second is, is why we're here tonight and that is, is, that is you, um, EMS evaluation and treatment. We want um, you guys to get on scene quickly identify uh, what's happening with the patient, evaluate the patient, and then provide appropriate treatment, and then um, transport to link three, which is the emergency department. Um, the cath lab where uh, Dr. Ambender and I work are, is the last link, and that's where we initiate reperfusion therapy. So the total ischemic time starts from symptom onset and then from the time we uh, deploy device. Next slide. I wanted to share some specific um, metrics, quality metrics with this group. And this is specific to our program. We're really, really proud of our program at St. Joe's. And, and we base that off our strong EMS partnership. We have a monthly meeting um, and we have our EMS partners attend every month. And we're constantly getting feedback and giving feedback. Um, and we attribute our success to this. Um, we do provide case-specific feedback. You can hit um, enter, Dan. 
Um, and then um, we do have an open invitation. You can keep going. Um, an open invitation for our EMS team members to accompany the patient to the cath lab. We realize you guys are super busy, but if you have the time and don't have to get back on the road, we welcome you to follow that patient through the ER and come to the cath lab. Um, there's staff members that are available and can, can talk you through what's happening. Um, so just wanted to reemphasize, there's always an open invitation for you to join the patient in the cath lab. We're happy to have you. Um, so I want to go back once, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to show, so with the, um, the American Heart, um, probably most of you know that we have 90 minutes from the time EMS arrives at the patient's side to the device deployment. So we have 90 minutes if that patient hits our ED um, as a walk-in, we have 90 minutes if EMS brings the patient. So we are um, incredibly proud of our program and we have succeeded at 100% um, consistently. Um, and this is because of your hard work. And if you look at our national benchmark, which hovers around 74, 76%, that's pretty incredible. Um, so again, just can't thank you guys enough. It is, is your work that drives this and gets, and gets, the, um, gets the chain started. Next slide. Um, so I just also wanted to just share some statistics. In 2023, 40 of our STEMI patients were received via EMS. So that accounts for 47% of the population that we saw at St. Joe's. The rest of our STEMI um, patients are walk-in. So we are, we're, again, constantly out in the community emphasizing the importance of activating the system via 911. We certainly don't want patients walking into the emergency room. We want them calling 911, getting you guys on scene, and transporting the patient to us safely. Um, in 2024, you can hit enter, Dan. Um, so far, we've had 27%. So we're still hanging in the 40s. About 42% of our STEMI population is, is coming in via EMS. Next slide. I just wanted to kind of share some fun statistics with this group. And, you know, it's always good to have a little bit of healthy competition, right? So um, I have some of our average and our fastest um, first medical contact to primary P. CI, and I actually have what medic unit has the fastest. So if you guys want me to share that, I'm happy to do that. Um, so in 2023, our average first medical contact to primary PCI at St. Joe's is 75.6 minutes, which is pretty incredible. Next, our fastest was 41 minutes. And um, I want to shout out medic 17 for that. In 2024, our average was 73 minutes. So we're gaining um, you, you know, every minute counts. So even 2.6 minutes is significant. And our fastest was 53 minutes and a shout out to medic 60 for that one. Um, patient side to EKG. So our goal for this metric is 10 minutes. We'd like that to be 10 minutes or less. So in 2023, our average was six minutes. The fastest was two minutes, and this was a three-way tie. Medic 11, Medic 17, and Medic 102. Um, in 2024, our average was six minutes and our fastest was one minute. And shout out to Medic 60 again for that one. Um, <clears throat> the next step is, is once you get that EKG, we need that hospital consult because that's what's gonna get our cath lab team on the road, which is critical. Our, the team, the expectation is our team is on site within 30 minutes. So the faster we can get them activated and on the road, the faster we can get that patient in, in the cath lab. Um, so we, this is, the goal for this metric is 10 minutes. And we like to split this five minutes for EMS and five minutes for the ED. Because by the time the, e, the EKG is transmitted, we need somebody to take a look at that, confirm it as a STEMI, and then activate. Um, we do pretty well with this. I think this is where we could use a little bit of improvement and shave like a few minutes off. Um, so in 2023, our average was nine minutes. The fastest was two minutes. And that was a three-way tie with Medic 14, Medic 54, and Medic A475. Um, and then in 2024, our average was eight minutes. And the fastest was actually zero minutes. So big shout out to Medic 17 for that one. 
Um, and I just want to reemphasize at St. Joe's, we always um, stress to our EMS partners, as soon as you get that EKG, if it looks like a STEMI, call it in and say, I have a STEMI. We don't need any more information. The important thing is we get that team on the road. If they arrive to the hospital and it's later determined not to be a STEMI, that's okay. We can cancel the team and send them home. They're happy to go back to sleep. Um, but the important thing is that that they get to the hospital as soon as they can so that they can be prepared to accept that patient when um, when you arrive. And my last slide, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Ambender, is, you know, this is our this is our motto at St. Joe's, um, better never stops. Um, and I just threw this in here. Excellence isn't a, isn't a one week or one year ideal. It's a constant. We're constantly looking to get better. So even though our metrics look great and our patient outcomes look great, we still want it better. Um, and you um, as EMS providers are an integral part of that. And um, we're happy to support you in any way we can and really, really appreciate your partnership in taking care of our patients. All right, so I will take over here and talk to you about the STEMI program, not STEMI, but more about the pathophysiology and understanding of STEMI. Um, but thank you so much, Jen, for uh, filling in all of that uh, statistics and data and sparking the competition. Honestly, um, you know, our job is to reperfuse, and that's what we're focused on. But I just cannot emphasize enough how much you all are just the critical part of this chain. Because, you know, if a patient, we've, we've unfortunately had patients that show up to not usually EMS, but other, you know, healthcare providers with a STEMI unrecognized they come in 12 hours later. And the difference for that patient's outcome is just so drastically different. So, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it um, and a STEMI isn't activated, we the it, it doesn't help. You can have as many EKGs printing out, but if there's no connection in terms of that chain, um, it doesn't do the patient any good. So kudos to all of your work. And we love having you in the cat lab. It's super fun. Stay, hang around. We're um, excited to learn from you because pre-hospital medicine is something that I am particularly extremely weak on, um, so I can gain so much from you, and you're always welcome to learn um, how to cat. We could train you up uh, with a couple of YouTube videos and some great experience. So let's talk about STEMI. So here's a pretty nasty picture of an artery, and what you can see here is that this is what we call the lumen of the artery, and inside here is a plaque, and a, and a heart attack the traditional ones that we're going to be talking about for the most part is when there is a rupture between this this basically sack of garbage which which is inside of the vessel wall and it starts coming in contact with the contents of the bloodstream when you start having that contact it's almost like a pylon on a football field where the football gets loose and all of a sudden you have just a ton of football players jumping on the blood you know jumping on it and those football players in this analogy would be like platelet aggregation. And so you go from an artery that had great luminal flow to an artery that immediately gets uh, clogged. And this is occurring over you know, minutes to hours. It's also very dynamic because the body has defense mechanisms. So while the football players from the offense are diving on the football field, the defense is trying to pick them up and pull them off. And so you end up basically having patients present with symptoms that may get better or worse or better or worse, and their clinical picture may get better or worse. But it doesn't mean that there's no underlying problem that may ultimately overcome the body's defense system. So this is a good picture to kind of think of when you're thinking of STEMI. Uh, so just to remind us of coronary arteries. So the heart pumps blood out into this big aorta, and that aorta feeds back the heart, the blood that it needs through these coronary arteries. And that's what we're, being, what we're talking about. So all of the blood that goes through the heart doesn't supply any blood actually to the heart muscle itself, but rather it's these small coronary arteries that are just a couple millimeters in diameter that bring blood flow back to the heart so that the heart can act as the engine for the rest of the body. So I love this picture. Uh, this is, comes from the bodies exhibit, and this gave me a really great understanding of what the coronary arteries do. So over here, you can see that this big tube here, big, quote unquote, is the LAD, left anterior descending, what patients love to call the widow maker. But what, and, and I'll show you some angiography pictures of what that looks like in angiography in the cath lab, and you'll get the sense that, okay, it's just this big artery. But what you don't see in the cath lab, and you can really only see at the microscopic level, is all of these teeny, teeny, teeny blood vessels that are important for gas exchange and oxygen delivery. 
So depending on where the STEMI is, but if you have an occlusion, let's say high up in the proximal LED, then you can see that all of the muscle that the LED provides blood flow to is going to start to get ischemic. And that ischemia happens immediately. I used to do research on pigs and give them heart attacks and measure like the different aspects of the heart. And I can tell you, if you put up a balloon in a pig heart and it's the same thing in a human heart and you just start holding it for 30 seconds, that's starting to be 30 seconds of ischemia and the heart muscle reacts very much to that. So this is what we're talking about when we're dealing with STEMI. We're dealing with the preservation of all of this myocardium when it comes to the LED, all of this myocardium or heart muscle when it comes to the circumflex, and all of this myocardium when it comes to the right coronary artery. So this is the why there is so much at stake. And also not all STEMIs are the same because if you have a blockage that's further down here, say like in this part of the artery, even though it's the LED, you're only having this aspect of the heart at risk. So that patient's presentation is probably gonna be a little bit less um, severe than somebody whose LED is occluded proximally. And so the location of the blockage will also greatly matter. And then finally, patients will have different anatomies. So somebody's LED may be huge and wrap around the entire heart and be like, you know, the mother of all LEDs. Well, that LED going down is going to put that patient at a much bigger risk than somebody whose LED is kind of on the smaller side, but their other blood vessels are much larger. So what's a STEMI? A STEMI is acute myocardial infarction that's caused by complete occlusion of the coronary artery. And the mechanism, as we talked about, is plaque rupture, thrombus formation, and then the coronary artery gets occluded. And so the consequence is cell death, ischemic damage, and potential for cardiac arrest. And we'll kind of go into why those consequences occur. The key here is that a STEMI, in general, refers to when the artery is totally occluded. Um, and here's kind of like a video that will highlight that. Whereas you could still have acute myocardial infarction where you have some flow. So this is an example of something I ripped off of BioDigital a couple of years ago, but it does highlight the fact that here you have exposure of that lipid core that we showed earlier, that, that plaque in the artery wall, and now you start having this aggregation of platelets and blood cells, and this will start to cause a lack of flow. And in this case, it's the LED, and so the LED is starting to become dead. And you, by recognizing this, by the EKG are basically starting to say, let me go and help reverse that process. Now, this is kind of interesting. So this is uh, what would have been the LAD. And um, so basically they did a lot of studies. Uh, the New England Journal published this, this, uh, this actually a while back, and it showed that different patients will have blockages that occur in different spots in the same artery at like the same time. So for example, these black arrows show that there's a plaque rupture over here, but what you can see here is that there is some blood flow that's getting through. So that's not 100%. That's probably 70 to 80% or maybe 90%. So there is some blood getting flu, but but then you have a second plaque with, the, with these arrows here showing that you have complete occlusion. So if you just had this first plaque, you probably wouldn't have an all-out STEMI, but by you have the second one that really takes out the entire artery. Uh, but the uh, the other point about this is that when the patients, even though the blockage is at a localized area, you could see that there's something about the patient's bloodstream that's angry. Either it's inflammation or something else, but but basically it's multiple of these plaques could pop and rupture at the same time. So that's it's it's a it's 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 a, a localized problem, but there's a systemic aspect to it. And so your patients may have something that predisposes them to that, like even the flu, which will make them, let's say, pro, you know, um, uh, thrombotic. And you can have different areas of plaque rupture in the same patient, in the same artery, in the same setting. So it's just an unusual, it's, a, it's just something interesting to note. This is like a, a really cool way of looking at the heart arteries. I'm begging Jen to get me this toy so I can look at the heart arteries here at St. Joe's this way. This is called OCT. That's not important for this conversation, but what it's looking at is the inside of the artery and it uses light. And what you could see here is that this is the lining of the heart artery. And now you can see that there is a plaque over here and this is a rupture into the lumen of the artery. And this rupture is causing thrombus to form. And that's kind of the cross-sectional thing that you would see in a STEMI. You could also have plaque erosion where it's not a rupture, but it erodes into this core of lipids and other garbage. And again, when those things come in contact with the bloodstream, which is the black here, you basically start getting this cascade that ultimately ends up with an occlusion. If it's a full occlusion, that's going to be a STEMI. If it's a not full occlusion, you probably have a, what we call an end STEMI or not a STEMI. 
So this is like uh, the, the classic, classic diagram that points this out. And I think it's so important to understand this because the, path out, the pathology of the coronary arteries is going to dictate what we're going to be seeing on the EKG. And that's going to dictate the entire plan for the patient. And it makes a lot of sense. So if you look over here, the patient, you only, you know, you're, you're blessed to see the patient right at the beginning. And that's when they're saying, I have chest pain. So that's all we that's all the information we uncover. If you uh, don't do an EKG, that's all the information we're going to be having, and we can't really act on that. But what is going on inside of the patient's heart is going to be dictated uh, and guided by the electrical signals that come from the EKG, which we'll get into a little bit sooner. But you can have a patient that has a blockage that's not fully occluding. So let's just say it's like 90% block, and that's enough blood flow for them to get flow at rest. So they're fine. But then they may tell you that every time they go up the stairs, they get chest pain. And when they go and then stop and re relax, they feel better. And maybe they'll take a nitro pill or you know something like that, or nitro sublingual, and it'll get better. That's what we call stable angina. It's stable because the patient the plaque is stable, but the patient is doing something to exert themselves, so they need more energy, and they just cannot get that energy because of that obstruction. Those is, uh, are called stable angina, and you're not going to see those patients as much because those are the patients that are going to go see their outpatient cardiologist or urgent care or something like that. They're not going to be sitting there necessarily calling out for help um, while they have chest pain at rest. But in an acute coronary syndrome where you have a smaller plaque, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big giant plaque, but now you develop that thrombus. And like I said, that whole cascade. Now all of a sudden you go from, um, you know, something that's, you know, 20% to 80%, they are going to have an acute change in the artery that they're going to feel and let you know about. And if it occurs at rest, uh, and you get basically full occlusion, that's going to develop into a STEMI. So following this down here, what we see on the EKG is in both of the cases where it's partially occluded or non-obstructive or non-thrombotic plaque, something chronic, and they exert themselves, or it's a new plaque rupture, but it's not fully occlusive, you will get usually ST depressions. So that's going to be changes on the EKG that, you know, it looks ischemic, right? You could tell this is abnormal, but it may not give you those elevations. Whereas when you get a full occlusion, particularly when it's acute, you start to get these ST elevations. And that tells you time is muscle. Because no matter how much blood flow is going to the heart, that area of the blood, uh, that area of the heart is getting no blood flow. By definition, it's fully occluded. And there's nothing you can do to help that patient except to re you know, basically reperfuse. So that's kind of the gist. I don't even want to go too far down this uh, algorithm, but that's kind of the fundamental idea. There's stable coronary disease, there's unstable coronary disease that's not fully occlusive, and then there's unstable coronary disease that's fully occlusive. And the treatment algorithm is going to depend very much on which one of those is occurring. So let's just talk about the clinical presentation of STEMI. So the typical symptoms that you're going to have are heaviness, squeezing, radiating of the arm, neck, or back you'll have associated shortness of breath, diaphoresis, and nausea. Usually when you have a patient that has a STEMI, you know something's wrong, like your gestalt is kicked in, like you can see, but that's not always the case. Diabetic patients may not give you those typical symptoms, um, and uh, particularly in women, that, that you can have what we call, what we used to call atypical symptoms, but we really shy away from calling it that, because if we have a suspicion that there's a coronary process, we don't nitpick too much on the symptoms, get that EKG. That EKG is going to be very helpful. If it's a STEMI, you know where you're going. If it's not a STEMI, then you have time. That's what you bought yourself. And so you can figure out what's going on by bringing them to the hospital, labs, imaging. You have all the time in, in the world to figure out what's going on so that you can get the patient the actual care that they need. If it turns out to be a coronary syndrome, it'll be picked up, but it doesn't need to be going straight to the cath lab. You have to basically suss it out, divide, you know, figure out what's going on. So why does this matter? Okay, this really matters. Early detection really matters. And I think the best way to understand that is to think about what happens in the end. Like, what if we don't do anything? Um, what will occur? So the big complications of STEMI are pump and heart failure. You've probably seen this. You've got a patient with a STEMI and their blood pressure is just tanked, right? That could be because of left ventricular dysfunction and cardiogenic shock. Uh, they're leading to poor perfusion. And then remember, it's a vicious cycle, right? So you initially have an LAD that has a blockage, but the other arteries are fine. So great. The LAD is ischemic and that part of the heart is starting to you know, pump poorly. But if that's a very big LAD and a very big territory involved, then all of a sudden that part of the muscle stops perfusing. 
Well, that part of the muscle is very important for blood pressure. So now the blood pressure is down. So now the right coronary artery and the circumflex artery, which originally were fine, also have now have poor perfusion. And so the entire heart becomes ischemic. The entire heart becomes ischemic. That starts making the patient go down the cascade, which leads to death. And you can't get them out of it unless you reverse that process medically. So that is pump failure. You could also have isolated right ventricular failure, particularly if it's a right coronary or a dominant left coronary. And those patients present a little differently. It's almost like if you've seen it, you know, it's like an odd situation because their breathing might be okay, but for some reason their, their blood pressure is just in the, you know, totally tanked. And so it's an uh, inability for that right ventricle to squeeze and bring blood to the left ventricle. So the lungs are fine because you don't have the pulmonary edema that you might see in cardiogenic shock because you haven't, you haven't had the congestion at the left ventricle, but the left ventricle doesn't have any flow to pump. So it's empty. So you end up having this weird scenario where you have hypotensin and the blood and the, you know, the patient's oxygenating well, and they're just like not responsive to, um, to, uh, to usually medications that raise the blood pressure. Fluids are actually the treatment in this case, because that helps support the right ventricle for a different discussion. But those are the two kinds of pump failure that you'll see in uh, coronary, in, in uh, late, usually late presenters. Now, early presenters could have ventricular arrhythmia. So, you know, patients can present with cardiac arrest. Obviously, you guys know the difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack. We all have to educate the you know, people out there because there's a lot of confusion between the two concepts. But this is one of the links where you can have heart attack that's actually from a, or from a um, sorry, heart attack leading to a sudden arrest, usually through a ventricular tachycardia. Atrial tachycardias can also develop and bradyarrhythmias, particularly with RCA infarcts. So those patients could also be hypotensive or in cardiogenic shock from an arrhythmia. And that, uh, you know, basically is a whole different aspect. Now, the, the uh, patients can present early or late with these things. And what I used to do is actually, I used to take um, the pigs and we would put the balloons up and see how long it takes for somebody to go into pump failure, the pigs actually, or how fast they go into arrhythmias. And what we found is that the pump failure actually occurs first and the arrhythmias occur later, usually like 20 minutes out. So if you have a blocked artery, the first thing that's gonna happen is pump failure. So it really depends on what, the artery supplying. If the artery is huge, you're going to then have, you know, potentially pump failure. If the artery supplies a small area, then you may not have the pump failure, but you can still develop the arrhythmia later on. And we see a lot of arrhythmia with circumflex artery occlusions and the circumflex may not be a big, you know, aspect of the heart pump. So the patient may be normotensive, but then all of a sudden go into their arrhythmia. So anyways, so, and then the, this is like uh, this is like the end stage of a STEMI that really doesn't get perfused or the patient presents late. And these are complications of, of, of uh, end STEMI. And to be honest, they're devastating. So the complications, they're called mechanical complications. They have drastically reduced in the era of reperfusion. And that's because of people like you. Early detection, early transport, early notification, all of those things prevents mechanical complications of STEMI. The, it's, it's sad, obviously, if a patient waited three days to come, but a lot of times patients don't and they call EMS when they're nervous. And, and this is where that EKG, that recognition, that spidey sense saves lives. So one uh, kind of mechanical rupture is what's called mechanical, I'm sorry, mechanical complication is papillary muscle rupture. So the mitral valve is a very complex valve, but it's basically what holds the blood from in the left ventricle during the squeeze. It's a really important aspect of flow. And if you lose the mitral valve acutely, that can you know, cause catastrophic hypotension and severe pulmonary edema as all of the blood flow that's leaving the ventricle goes back into the lungs with each and every beat. So a papillary muscle is a very important muscle that holds that valve together. And if you have an MI right at that spot, you can rupture that muscle and one can develop severe pulmonary edema very rapidly. It is not subtle. You may even have a breathing tube in them and see the pulmonary edema shoot out the tube with so much force because of all of that blood flow that's being directed right at the lungs. You can have what's called a ventricular septal defect. That's where the septum between the ventricle and the right ventricle and the left ventricle becomes ruptured. And you could start to develop backflow from the left ventricle, which is a meatier, mightier ventricle, into the right ventricle, which is usually a poopier, weaker ventricle. And now you'll have flow that goes back. This extra flow overwhelms the right side of the heart, which is not used to all of this extra flow, and it starts to fail. You kind of can get a right ventricular failure. Pseudoaneurysm is when the ventricle wall 
has become so weak because of scar, so it outpouches out, and that could rupture. And free wall rupture is really devastating. That's where the actual wall ruptures. And now you have blood, again, being ejected out of the mighty left ventricle into the pericardium, overwhelming the pericardial sac, re creating really high pressures around the heart, inability to fill the heart, and leading to sudden death. All of these things, for the most part, are surgical emergencies. But even with going to the surgery, that's still high risk because remember, the muscle that the surgeons will be dealing with is going to be mush meat because this muscle has just died. So it's going to be edematous, inflamed, and it's sometimes very hard for them to suture. So a mechanical complication is really, really what we're avoiding. And you should feel great about bringing in a patient with an end stem, a STEMI early because these are the complications that you are helping them avoid. And you won't even know how many patients you've saved by bringing them in early. Um, but uh, but that's that is really really important. I'm going to skip the focus history here, but but in general, the key in pre-hospital is if you think the patient's having a coronary syndrome, look for it. That's it because you don't want to spend too much time figuring out. Let the the nerdy doctors who have more time in their hands start to you know go through this more. Your job is does this patient have a STEMI or not? And if they have a STEMI, let's get them there, you know, because that's what matters the most. But there are some things that are suggestive of ischemia and symptoms that are suggestive that they're not ischemia. But uh, like I said, when in doubt, EKG and bring them in. And the other thing to notice is that we shouldn't always anchor on STEMI. Um, there are other causes of chest pain and we have to go through them in a very systematic way and sometimes a very fast systematic way. But if we identify a STEMI, usually that's what the problem is and we can just um, go with that uh, working diagnosis. So I'm going to have a couple of cases that are mixed in throughout here. And by the way, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, otherwise, I will certainly continue rambling. Um, and, uh, but uh, these are going to have some videos associated with it. If you can see them, great. I'll describe them as they come along. So here's a case of acute chest pain. So it's a 54-year-old man who presents with acute chest pain. The onset was 13 minutes, and the patient was just driving an 18-wheeler. He honestly was just cruising along when all of a sudden, bam. He just feels this crazy, crazy chest pain. He's got a past medical history of high blood pressure, long smoking history, but no other history of heart failure. He never sees a cardiologist. And he just woke up feeling well, and then boom, it's a central chest pain, 10 out of 10, radiating down his neck, arm, and belly. So that's important. So that radiation down the belly is a little bit of a clue, not so typical of STEMI. And another pearl is if your patient looks like they're jumping off of the stretcher, uh, they just like cannot, cannot sit still. A lot of times that's actually not going to be a coronary. Patients with coronary, it's like a, usually they're, they're, they're just like clutching their chest or just like grimacing. But this patient was jumping up and down off of the stretcher. He just felt totally awful. He was diaphoretic nausea and his vital signs were fine. His ECG was without STEMI. And so so it's not STEMI, so let's evaluate it. We got some time and we get a chest X-ray. This is a, a while ago and this was actually a baby when I was there. But you see in this chest X-ray, it was relatively normal. And then in this chest X-ray, just at 2 p.m. several hours later, this this basically what we call the mediastinum or the you know soft tissue inside of the chest expanded. And that is concerning for an aortic dissection. So again, this patient presented with some signs that were suspicious of that. And so here's a CT scan and it's gonna show you basically this, this is the dissection flap in this aortic dissection and it goes pretty much all the way down um, to the kidneys. And so this patient presented not with STEMI, but with acute coronary syndrome appearing pain, he actually got calf, but the calf was negative and really this was an aortic dissection and he went to the emergency, uh, he went to the surgery and basically ended up getting this repaired and did well. But it's important to identify that in this kind of case. Here's a transesophageal echo, and what I'll show you is that the, this flappy thing is the dissection that's flapping around. Now, I bring up this case because aortic dissection can sometimes mimic STEMI. In fact, one of the first deaths that I, that I had on the cath lab table was a patient who came in with a right coronary uh, infarct, big STEMI. We brought him to the cath lab, and I couldn't engage the right coronary artery. And I realized right away, this patient is likely not having uh, an acute coronary syndrome from a plaque rupture, but he probably has an aortic dissection. Um, and so I shot the, you know, the aorta, and I showed that the aortic dissection was propagating down into the right coronary artery. So while it was presenting as a STEMI, the actual problem was this flap that was occluding flow down the right coronary artery. So unfortunately, the patient was not a surgical candidate and there was nothing really that we could be doing for the patient. So, um, but, but basically that's the key. So you can sometimes have 
uh, an aortic dissection that mimics a STEMI or really is causing a STEMI, but it's not from a plaque rupture, but it's from this dissection flap that can kind of flap in there. But anyways, this patient actually did well, and uh, I'm glad to say that he continues to do well. Here's another case of an EKG, but a patient coming in with chest pain, but there's no STEMI right now. But uh, this patient comes with dyspnea, tachycardia, but clear lungs. So that's a clue. Um, clear lungs and chest pain should always be something we think about pulmonary embolism. You could see the S1 and the QT3. These are signs that you can see on the EKG with pulmonary embolism. And an echocardiogram showing the right ventricle is dilated and blown out and not really functioning well. And this can, and then this underfilled left ventricle. So this is a sign of pulmonary embolism on echo. And indeed, the patient does have extensive pulmonary emboli. And that's what's shown here in the CT scan highlighted by these circles. So this patient presents a little bit different than our typical ACS patients. Pulmonary embolism should honestly always be on our differential. But again, their EKG didn't show STEMI. And so we were able to work the patient up, identify the actual etiology, and treat the patient accordingly, which is a very different treatment plan than acute coronary syndrome. So don't forget to put the history in context. Um, you know, patients have established, you know, coronary disease. They're more likely to be having an MI, but that's not always the case. Uh, you know, and also you're going to kind of get some assessment of recent travel, different, can't, you know, ongoing cancers, things that would make somebody have more, you know, uh, a propensity for pulmonary embolism. You may end up going that route of diagnosis. But notice the thing was that that EKG didn't show STEMI, and therefore we were able to take some time and figure it out. Here's another case. This is a really important case that highlights the value of serial ECGs. So Jen had that Michael Jordan comment about excellence, and that applies to serial EKGs also. Remember, it's a pylon in the coronary artery where the offense is laying down some serious people on top of that football, but the defense is ripping them off. Right. And so basically you can have a situation where the EKG could be normal one minute and abnormal the other. And so here's an example of that. This is a very young patient who happened to have been um, using cocaine, but otherwise like was known to be pretty healthy. Um, but he presents with uh, chest pain. So he's just he's a funny kid. And I, I met him uh, and I've been following him ever since. It was a couple of years ago. Funny kid all of a sudden arrests in the emergency room, it goes from a normal EKG to an abnormal EKG, and the post-arrest EKG clearly shows anterolateral STEMI, just like that. Amazing. So he, uh, you know, peak troponin ends up, which is, uh, you know, a, a biomarker of muscle, muscle necrosis is elevated. His echo is showing abnormalities. They did get an echo on him because he's so young. This is kind of an odd situation. And this echo shows LAD territory infarction or ischemia. So it's all consistent with the LAD. This is really weird. This patient is so young. But sure enough, you'll see he actually does have a thrombus, probably related to the cocaine use, which cocaine can accelerate atherosclerosis, but it could also cause plaque ruptures. And that's what happens. This is the LAD showing here, and it's like a very hazy lesion. It's full of thrombus. So uh, he ended up getting a stent, and he's doing quite fine. And uh, he tells me he doesn't use much cocaine anymore. Um, but uh, And this just is going to play through and show the stent. Uh, that's the stent ballooning. And here you have a nice artery. And again, you see this thrombus pre and it's post, it's very, it looks very good. Patient did, did quite well. But uh, it's very important to take those serial ECGs and, and just remember these things are dynamic. So it's not case closed. We're always, always striving for excellence. And if the suspicion is high for acute coronary syndrome, then, uh, then go with it. By the way, this patient swears that he like, you know, saw some angels during his arrest. He, he has a very vivid memory of it. So I don't, uh, it's very interesting sometimes to talk to patients who have gone through this, but I'm so glad he's doing well. Anyways, so let's shift from uh, cases of, of the diagnosis to the initial management of chest pain. A targeted physical exam is always important, um, but I'll just bring up these things here, indicators of worse prognosis. So if you have somebody that you suspect coronary syndrome and their blood pressure is low, heart rate's high, you know, these are obvious things, but they really pretend a poor, poor prognosis unless you can reverse this process quickly. Obviously, if they're evidence of end organ failure, like, you know, potentially mental, alter mental status and things like that. Persistence of chest pain that doesn't go away, which probably tells you that there's ongoing ischemia and a delayed presentation. That's really the worst. When the patient says, I've had this for three days and my wife finally got me to come in or call you guys, that's that's tough. Um, anyways, so this is actually represented in the AHA guidelines. So the guidelines basically talk about a physical exam and having it focused because it can help you differentiate these 
different syndromes, acute coronary syndromes, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, and esophageal rupture. And so it's very, it, it, it does quite help you. An acute coronary syndrome will be basically coming along with some of these signs and symptoms of heart failure. So it's very important to guide us to a cardiac, you know, particularly cardiac issue. And also it's going to help us with prognosis. If a patient is in heart failure, they're in worst case scenario. So um, a good thing to do, but don't let it hold us up. What if they're at the office, right? Somebody, the doctor calls you uh, because their patient has chest pain. They're, you know, doing a Durham exam and the patient tells them that they're, you know, they're having chest pain. Well, you know, patients with clinical evidence of ACS um, that are being seen in the office should be rapidly, urgently sent to the emergency department, ideally by you. Because as we know with my friend over there in the last case, he was doing fine until he wasn't. But basically, get that EKG. That's going to be the main thing to do. Do it fast, class one indication. But do not dilly-dally, right? If they have acute pain and you think it's ACS, don't let the doctor say, I'm going to get a troponin and wait for that to result. And I'll decide based on the troponin if they should come in. That is not a good idea. Time is muscle. Get them into a place that can assess them for a coronary syndrome and treat them for a coronary syndrome. Um, and so basically in all patients, if they present with acute chest pain, regardless of the setting, ECG, get it done, class one. And if they basically present to the emergency department after acute, then we should get the troponin. It's not going to delay the man you know, management. Get the troponin. It's going to help us later. But don't dilly-dally. Labs are not the important thing. It's the EKG. Can't emphasize that enough. And you guys know that very well. So when you're triaging chest pain, focus history, targeted physical exam, bam, clock that EKG. And obviously we want it in less than 10 minutes, as Jen said earlier. And then... We get the EKG, now we can make some distinctions. Patient's clinically stable, are they at risk for life-threatening illness? We can sort of get the a spidey senses up, emergent, urgent, or not urgent. This is Dr. Wilhelm Eindhoven. So this is the man who's uh, the legend behind the ECG. And uh, obviously, uh, luckily the ECG machines have gotten a lot better because this might've been hard to be, uh, you know, do in your ambulance. Um, with this water sloshing around, but this is the original ECG, and uh, this is uh, where they kind of uh, started to use the three leads, the limb leads, to triangulate and get those limb leads. This is before the precordial leads, but this is the beginning, and this ended up being extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and so the ECG is the key. Chest pain, you know, you're jumping to that ECG. If you're in STEMI, you're working within STEMI guidelines. Anything else, you have room to figure it out. So, you know, a lot of times people will activate the cath lab and they'll show us an EKG and the EKG will not have STEMI. If the, whether it's in the middle of the night and I'm sleeping or whether it's the daytime and I'm wide awake, I love to cath patients if they need it. But sometimes it takes, sometimes time gives all the answers you need or that extra understanding of what's going on with the patient. So the reason why STEMI is such a big deal is because you have a full occlusion and time is muscle. But when you don't have STEMI, there's no studies that show rushing to the cath lab helps. Sometimes it actually helps to slow down. Hey, this patient's INR is really high. Let's reduce the risk of bleeding. Their creatinine is really high. Why don't we optimize them from a renal status standpoint before we give them contrast? They're in terrible heart failure. Why have them go to the cath lab, lay flat, and then have a respiratory arrest? Let's give them some diuresis, get a couple hours under our belt, have them pee it out and then go. So it could be frustrating sometimes when people call for it. They know it's an acute syndrome. Like they, they know it like, uh, you know, like they say, you know what pornography is. They know what a coronary syndrome is. They see the patient, they know it, right? But the EKG doesn't show STEMI. It still helps sometimes to slow down and get more information and potentially manage the patient in the immediate setting. And like I said, you call me in the middle of the night and it's a STEMI, let's do it. You call me in the middle of the day and it's a STEMI, let's do it. You call in the middle of the night and the patient's chest pain has resolved, the EKG doesn't show STEMI. We sometimes will wanna wait to go to the cath lab so we can get more information, more data, and potentially increase the benefits of cath and reduce the complications of cath. So in our algorithm, it's very simple, EKG, diagnostic for STEMI, localize it, STEMI, boom, lab. Um, but it's important to understand the stages of ST elevation because that will help you guide A, in where am I in this process for the patient, and B, um, it'll help localize the STEMI and just determine if it's a STEMI or not. Of course, if there's any questions, when in doubt, phone a friend, call that emergency department and you know get, get an extra pair of eyes on it. But the first thing that occurs when you have an occlusion is these hyperacute T waves. Now, why is that? So it turns out 
we all know that when patients run out of energy, i.e. they die, the first thing that we might find is, or you know, not the first thing, but eventually they'll have rigor mortis. They clamp up, they get clenched. And that's because muscles want to clench. So it's easier for a muscle to clench than for a muscle to unclench. And the reason why that is, is because ATP, which is the energy building blocks of the cells, is what is is what's used to unclench or relax the muscles and so the heart is the same thing so the heart will tend to clench up when it's ischemic just like rigor mortis but in a localized setting well in the ekg the t wave represents depolarization that's that relaxing period and so the first thing that's impacted by lack of atp is going to be a change in those t waves because there's a problem with diastole or filling or sorry relaxing and same thing electrically and so you may see these hyperacute t waves first followed by the sd elevation which is more during the systole eventually those t waves are going to invert and then you will, one, I shouldn't say you, one will eventually develop what's called the Q wave. So the Q wave develops when there's already starting to be some scar tissue developing. And so that's going to be, you know, a late presenter may have Q waves. And then finally, after all said and done, the SD segment will return to the baseline. But if the Q wave has developed, then we're going to be stuck with those Q waves for usually the rest of life because that patient has developed irreversible damage. So if you have a patient that's presenting with STEMI, but there's no Q waves, that's a good sign because you're going to basically be early. But if you have a patient that says, I've had pain for three days and they have an anterior STEMI, but be, these uh, ginormous Q waves, then, you know, I already know that the uh, reperfusion is going to have a limited benefit for the patient. We obviously will try our best, particularly if they're still having the MI. So STEMI, basically, ST elevation is going to be something you want to see in two contiguous leads. Contiguous, we'll talk about the what that means by contiguous, but basically they're representing different aspects of the heart. I think of the EKG and different leads as different windows into the soul. So luckily we're blessed because of Eindhoven and all his friends with different windows into the soul. So if you see something in one window and you don't see it in the other window, but you're looking at the same thing, then maybe, maybe what you're seeing isn't real in the first place. So what we're asking for is you, can you see the STEMI in different leads that are associated with each other, but different windows. And if I see it in two windows, or two leads, then I'm very suspicious. Um, the the cut point of SD elevation segment is one millimeter in the precordial leads, with the exception of v, uh, in, of all the leads except for V2 and V3. V2 and V3 in men, um, you want to see 2.5, and in women too. You're asking that. Uh, because those leads are the closest to the surface of the EKG, right? They're right, those precordial leads are right on top of the heart. And so you expect those to have high, if there's a real STEMI, you expect them to be high. But if they're lower than the one millimeter, you know, or one millimeter, uh, or lower than 2.5 or two, so then that's not meeting criteria. But just because you have not meeting criteria, if your spidey senses are up, you can still treat that patient as a STEMI, but it won't technically make criteria and don't wouldn't start the clock for that. Um, but, you know, obviously all these things are a spectrum and all patients are different and different body habitus will give us different levels of, of, um, of changes. You can have a tombstone STEMI that, you know, would, everybody would recognize from a million miles away and a subtle, subtle, subtle inferior MI with just like these little, little SD elevations that make the criteria. And both could be as deleterious, depends on the patient, the myocardium, and also where the leads are located for each patient. But just like I said, you want to see the same thing from two windows. If you look at the other side of the house, like let's say you're peering into the house from that has different windows. You got front door windows and back door windows, and you're looking at the same couch. You want to see, is there a couch in the house or not? Well, if you see them from the front and then you go to the back and look at the same room and you don't see the couch, right, then maybe you're seeing an optical illusion. You should be able to see the, um, the, the reciprocal of the back side of the couch in this analogy, which I'm not sure is working. I'll move on from that. But the point is, you should be able to see the same phenomenon from different directions. So that's what reciprocal changes are. So if certain leads are looking at the front part of the heart, other leads are looking for the back part of the heart. And so if you see a STEMI in the front part of the heart, you should see inferior changes in the back part of the heart. And that's kind of the gist. When you have a left bundle, all bets are lost. You know, people have been using Scarbosa criteria. I actually run uh, or, or co-moderate uh, uh, a chat where we have a lot of EMS providers and there's so much debate about Scarbosa criteria. If you have a left bundle branch, it's really, really hard. You know, you could use these criteria, but ultimately speaking, I think you have a left bundle branch block and the patient's behaving like ACS, you're gonna treat it like ACS. 
if the patient is not behaving like ACS and they have a left bundle branch block and, you know, the, th the, the changes are, you know, basically, you know, go with the left bundle branch block, then you have time. You're probably not dealing with a, a big anterior infarction. So when it comes to lead localization, this is it. You know, we, we have the chart, but basically you got your high lateral leads, you got your inferior leads, you got your anterior and septal leads, and then you have lateral leads. And it just goes to where the leads are placed and you place them so you know where they are. And you're, these are just, again, different windows of looking at the electrical activity of the heart to give us a clue of what's going on with the patient. I love this. Uh, I learned this in intern year and I still do it honestly in the middle of the night when I get called. These are the five things I go through about STEMI. So I, I really like this uh, this schema here. But the so basically the question is, there's STEMI on the EKG, is it real or not? You know, and obviously for you, call it in. You got friends in the emergency department. So don't don't like wait too long, but but just at, for our own learning, this is what I do. I go and I localize. Okay, are they in two contiguous leads? Yes. Are they in reciprocal changes? Okay, great. So I use this acronym PAIL, P-A-I-L. So split P-A and I-L. So posterior and anterior leads will reciprocate each other. Now, the, we don't really have posterior leads. So sometimes an anterior STEMI may not have reciprocal changes because if it's really truly anterior, unless you have posterior leads on, you won't see the reciprocal depressions. But the posterior and anterior really reciprocate and inferior and lateral really reciprocate. So if you have you know, inferior STEMI and lateral depressions, I am on that. I, if when I see that, I'm really convinced that there's a STEMI. And I will say 99% time, that's the, truly the case. If you have inferior SD elevations and nothing in the lateral leads, then I will start asking about the history and get a little bit more. Remember I said that you first start with hyperacute T waves, but then you get an associated T wave inversion. So those associated T-wave inversions is a clue uh, that this change is really ischemic and going on, associated Q-waves, and especially a story of a late presenter. And then there's different shapes that the, you know, the waveform can have, convex versus concave, you know, whether it's a smiley face or a frowny face, you may have learned that. I put this last because it's the least important to me. It sort of supports it when one, two, three, and four are pointing away from STEMI. But I've been fooled before. Uh, I'll have a smiley face that's really a bad STEMI and uh, better take them to the lab. It's really about clinical context and put all the signs together. But anyways, so this is the five things that I use when I go through STEMIs. And uh, for the most part, it has been a good rule for me. So let's localize a little bit. Uh, so in localization is really important because A, it'll tell us what cap, you, that's not, you don't have to worry about localization, but I think it's fun for you to localize and then find out where the obstruction is. We're always happy to tell you where we found it. But um, it does matter because the location will pretend different prognoses. For example, if you have an RCA infarct, that's gonna have a different clinical course than an anterior infarct. So localization is very important, but you have to know how to localize in order to read the EKG. So let's go through some of these. So an acute inferior MI, you know, usually if you have, so, so just to remind ourselves, the right coronary artery and the left circumflex artery do run around the back of the heart and they kind of come close to each other. So they, you know, depending on people's anatomies, the right coronary artery may be huge and dominant and supply the left side, or the left circumflex artery may be huge and dominant and supply the right side. So the, it's sort of a tug of war in different patients whose who's artery is more dominant, but both can supply the inferior wall. So if you see ST elevations in three greater than two, that's you're, you're thinking more R, um, RCA versus circumflex. I'm less nitpicky in the, from the EMS perspective. It's more about inferior or anterior. Those are your bigger branch points. Whether it's a CERC or RCA, let us figure it out. And sometimes we're wrong also, and we just find the occlusion and fix it. But, but inferior is the most important thing. I, I'm dealing with an inferior MI, and there might be RV involvement. I may want to treat this patient a little bit differently than an anterior MI. So let's see. I think I could. Okay, so let's do this case over here. All right, so man presents with jaw and neck pain, and we got some ST elevations. You got inferior leads three greater than two. You have lateral depressions. That's what I said. That pale. That's that's the that's the uh, the uh, the inferior and the lateral. So here's a coronary. The left side has disease, but it's not so much blocked off. Not too bad. Here we have the right side, and it basically looks like a total occlusion here. It's thrombotic. It's nasty. But with a little ballooning, we start to see the thrombus develop, and we can suck out the thrombus, and that's what it looks like. 
this is what's going on inside of the body. You, you, this is what's causing the chest pain. All right. So like, basically we can suck it out. And now that we've, de you know, de you know, got rid of some of that clot, let's place a stent and smush the rest of this out of the way. And we got a pretty good result. Good flow, good blood flow. Uh, and so here you can see the beginning and the end, and this artery is huge. And also this is the inferior border of the heart. So this is that PDA is giving the border of the heart. This is echo is not as important for this conversation, but just to show that the right ventricle is a little bit stunned. That's what this echo is showing us. And so we can nurse the patient through it, either with giving them fluids, um, definitely avoiding nitrates and things like that. Uh, but it goes along, this is just showing echo, it's just showing the, the, the part of the ventricle that gets supplied by that area is a little bit weaker. Overall, the squeeze is very good. You could see, you can get a gist of that, even if you don't read echo, you can see mm -hmm. that the muscle overall is, is going quite nicely. And that's why these patients may present with RV failure, but they may not prevent, present like with all out cardiogenic shock. Was somebody saying something? Okay, so anterior MI, this is gonna be your acute anterior infarction. You're looking at your SD elevations in V1, two, three. And so here, basically, like I said, here are those criteria. Um, now, this helps us, okay, everything below this is more nuanced. If you're an EKG nerd, get into it. But you can sort of tell based on different aspects where the blockage is. Is it a proximal LED, mid LED, or a distal LED? And it just depends on different things. So if you have, I'll just point out this one over here. I think this is a good one to know. If you have S elevations anteriorly and an associated right bundle branch block, that's proximal LED. And the reason is because the artery that goes and supplies the right bundle is right off of the proximal LED. So if you see that, that's gonna be proximal LED. That's a patient really, really you wanna revascularize right away. The other things are important, but um, but anyways, I just wanted to point that out. But again, the key thing from pre-hospital standpoint is anterior, STEMI, that's what I got. Let's get this patient in. Uh, let Dan figure out where it is. But honestly, it, it doesn't really matter because the treatment is the same reperfuse and open it up, but it does give us a clue of where it's going to be. And honestly, if I do, for me personally, if I do this and I go through this algorithm and I'm wrong, meaning it's not the LED, then something's fishy. There's some other process that's going on. This may not be a plaque rupture. And I'll show you the differential diagnosis of STEMI that's with normal coronaries. So you have that sometimes. So sort of for me, I have to kind of predict where the blockage is going to be, because if the blockage is not there, then I might be dealing with a completely different diagnosis. And I got to get off that STEMI train and get, uh, get my thinking cap back on. So here's a case. So what you can see, I'll, I think it's a video also, but you, I'm showing you this is a right bundle branch block, but you also have STEMI. Now sometimes, see this SD elevation, like here you see it a little bit better. This can be tricky because the right bundle branch block, you might think at first that it's just a right bundle and it's not really a STEMI, but if you look at the actual SD segment, it is elevated. And then I also see, uh, so anyway, so, so this is probably gonna be a prox LED. Look in the inferior leads, you can see the reciprocal depressions here. Um, Anyways, sometimes in an LED territory, you'll see lateral elevations also, and that's because the LED supplies the lateral wall. So sometimes you can have an anterior and lateral elevations, and that's why, again, PAIL, tails, so posterior and anterior, so we're not seeing posterior well, but the, since the lateral aspect is also involved, we're going to also expect to see inferior reciprocal changes, and that's what you're seeing here. So here we go. Right here, this is just a little bit of coronary anatomy. You have a catheter here. We're injecting dye. And immediately, the vessel, which is the left main, splits into two arteries, the LAD and the uh, right coronary, the circumflex, sorry. The circumflex gives rise to these branches, and everything looks hunky-dory. A little bit of plaque here. Nothing major. Everything's helpful. But uh, we see a cutoff. There's a cutoff over here. This is a cutoff from an anterior STEMI. And what you can also see is that uh, it's proximal. It's right away, right when the vessel uh, separates. And you can also see this paucity or lack of blood vessels in this whole aspect of the heart. So something is missing and you'll see when it's revascularized how much of the heart is missing. And you're going to see not only is it an LED, but it's an LED with all these branches that go to the lateral wall. Oh, too bad. I don't have the after. The patient did well. It was revascularized. I'll show you some more cases. Here's another case. Oh, so sorry. So here is basically um, a case of lateral STEMI. 
So you have uh, this, sorry, this is another anterior lateral STEMI. So you have anterior elevations, lateral elevations, and inferior depressions, but it's not a right bundle branch block. So it may not be the prox LED, it could be the mid LED, but it does involve the lot of the precardium and also involves the lateral wall. So I'm concerned of a big aspect of territory that's being impacted here. And again, you have your reciprocal changes. These ones are not subtle. These can be recognized very quickly. Here's another case. Uh, this is going to be posterior MI. So the circumflex wraps around the back of the heart or the right corner it could wrap around the back part of the heart. Back part of the heart and inferior heart are the same. Back, underside, those are synonymous. Um, but what you could see here is that you have ST depressions anteriorly. So remember, we're looking at a patient from, in this aspect, from the front door window. But if I were to walk around the back door window, I might, and put on posterior leads, which I'll have a slide on later, you will probably see as the elevation there. So I'm not saying, I don't know what your algorithm is, whether or not you should get anterior or posterior leads. For me personally, I'm sold if somebody has an EKG like this, where I have ST depressions anteriorly and the story is really good. So I'm going to basically assume that this is a circumflex occlusion until proven otherwise. If the patient story is like, they were just like in the garden and they got a splinter and this is the EKG that we got for whatever reason, then I'll, you know, ask them to get other leads and whatnot. But if the story sounds like an ACS event and I'm seeing these ST depressions anteriorly, I may be really seeing ST elevations. And actually, next time you see this, take the paper and flip it up upside down and hold it up to the light. And you'll see that if you flip it up and hold it up to the light, you'll see these turn into Q wave MIs. See this initial R wave when it's flipped up down, upside down becomes a Q wave and these depressions become a, a segment elevation. So it's a, it's a cool nifty, you know, party trick that you can do if you want to impress your friends to show you that really this is a STEMI. If I look at it from the opposite vantage point, I'll see that it's truly a STEMI and not an end STEMI. Treatment algorithm is very different. And in general, it, it reminds us that not all of the arteries are going to be so apparent as equals on EKG. LADs tend to show up. Right coronary arteries tend to show up. But sometimes that annoying circumflex artery, because of the way it wraps around the side border of the heart, may not be detected on the traditional EKG. So the way I do this is if the patient sounds like they're having an acute occlusion and they're not, you know, they have chest pain that's refractory to medical therapy, um, and I'm concerned about the patient or the emergency serum doctors or the EMS or whoever's, you know, dealing with the patient is really concerned that this is an acute coronary syndrome and it's not, it's not subtle. Even if there's no STEMI, sometimes you can have a circumflex that's occluded and be electrically silent. So those are patients I might take to the cath lab a little bit sooner than later. So this is a EKG, I'm sorry, this is a cath showing a coronary artery. This is the circumflex and it's winding down the back of the heart. And here we have a 99% occlusion and resulting in basically posterior myocardial infarction. <clears throat> so these are what, so these are posterior leads just to show you that this is something you can do to suss out those, those ST elevations if you want to show it and document it. Or again, like I, I don't know what the algorithm is, but obviously follow it if they're, they're asking you to do these. But you can put on these leads from behind the patient and detect this in this picture, anterior is the bottom. So V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but then you can go around the back and add as many leads as you want. Because like I said, EKG leads are by you know convention, but really you can make as many windows into the heart as you want to. So you can do posterior, you can do right side of leads, whatever. I think that when it comes to ACS and questions about unsure situations, if it smells like ACS, just get the patient to the hospital the fastest you can get the patient there and we'll figure it, we'll take it from there, we'll figure it out. Um, if it smells like ACS, just treat it like ACS. You may uh, get these extra EKGs to, to, to build a case that it's a posterior MI and it can be helpful, but don't let it slow you down. That's the important part, I think. Time is still muscle and, um, and the, the time will also help figure out what's going on with the patient too. Here's examples of posterior leads to be seven, eight, nine, and they're showing some ST ele elevation in these leads. Um, and But look over here, V1, 2, and 3, this is the front windows of the heart, and these are the back windows of the heart. And you can see that it's reciprocal changes. So these posterior, leaflet, posterior leads are the reciprocal changes of these anterior leads. So it's a good example of that. Okay. Any questions on what I've said? Okay.
I hope I'm still connected with you guys. I'll continue. Um, there are STEMI equivalents, and we debate on my chat and also with our emergency room doctors this idea of STEMI equivalents and also acute. They, the other term that people use is OMI, OMI, occlusive myocardial infarction, where it's not a STEMI on EKG, but there are other signs that are what we call STEMI equivalents. So as far as STEMI equivalents go, if you have them, urgent cath is going to be indicated. But technically speaking, it is not going to clock in STEMI in terms of door to balloon time and those other metrics. And the reason is because not all of them uh, is because the data that that we got that we know that STEMI and reperfusion is really about STEMI and it's not about these other equivalents. It doesn't mean the patient's not having a myocardial infarction. It doesn't mean they shouldn't have emergent or urgent coronary angiography. But it just means that that's not making STEMI criteria. But there are STEMI equivalents. So conventional STEMI we talked about. There's one called the winter syndrome where you have these T waves that shoot up like rockets. So they like come down in ST segment down and then the shooting up rocket probably relates to more of that diastolic dysfunction that I talked about earlier. Posterior STEMI is different, but, uh, but we already talked about that. Hyperacute T waves we talked about. And then there's these Wellen signs. These Wellen, these are precordial T waves that are either biphasic, it goes up and down, or these like really deep inverted T waves in the precordial leads. Wellen sign is these EKG signs, and Wellen syndrome is a patient who is chest pain free, then chest pain severe, then chest pain free, then chest pain severe. What's happening in the Wellen's patient is the LAD, and it's usually proximal LAD, is 99% occluded. It's not 100%, but it's flipping back and forth. Remember, this is a dynamic process. The football players are piling on, and then just enough are coming up, enough back on, enough coming up. So the patient's symptoms are waxing and waning. I, we do see this a lot, and this EKG tells you it's proximal LAD. When you have Wellen sign and Wellen syndrome, I know they're going to have disease, and I know that uh, I try to get them. Uh, and and because uh, I know that, that we're going to be able to help the patient out. And if my partner and I are up for grabs, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I end up taking this case because they're very satisfying because usually the artery is 99% blocked and you see, so, so you could see the flow through the artery and it's a nice, easy fix and the patients feel much better right away. It's an early, early Prox LED MI and there's so much to save, right? And everything to lose by delaying the care. There's other things like... Uh, ischemia from left ventricular hypertrophy. These are, you know, these are phone a friend kind of things that you might see. Okay, so let's show some examples of hyperacute T waves. So here we go, sudden onset crushing chest pain. All right, this patient happens to have STEMI, but I wanna show you that it's also associated with these hyperacute T waves. Big, broad, asymmetric, they're asymmetric usually, which is interesting, which is different maybe than hyperkalemia. But then again, it's dynamic changes. You get real STEMI later, 20 minutes later. And again, here is this occlusion. This is showing a mid LED occlusion in this patient. So that's what these hyper T waves are. You have balloon, stent, and balloon. And voila, we have a beautiful artery and flow, and all is well. And the patient lives a happy, healthy life. Echo just showing this LED territory. And again, Obviously, this isn't an echo talk, but I just want to show you that these are real consequences. LAD has a territory, and if it's not supplying that territory, the muscle will die. A lot of times, this can come back after a couple of weeks, but time is muscle. There is so much at stake. Here's another case of what's called the winter's uh, waves. Here we go. So patient, 5 a.m., this patient walks in, first EKG with a STEMI. Now... For apparently five minutes later, it goes away. What the hell is going on? You get these basically to winter things. And this is like basically, again, it's part of the dynamic process of STEMI. Here it is. You get this depression with these super up sloping segments. Some people call them rocket T waves. And again, here's where you see it 99% blocked. There's that ugly, nasty thrombus, the sluggish flow. Like that's what's occurring. It's a dynamic process. This is supposed to be fancy. I was exploring with making videos at the time. So excuse my. Um, dizzying graphics here, but again, LED territory is out, okay? Poor flow. Get into the cath lab, get it open, and try to save as much of that myocardium. Look at this LED. It's massive, right? It's really, really, really wrapping that cardiac apex. So this is such an important vessel. So really, really such an important um, patient to get to reperfuse as soon as possible. Not only is it taking care of the 
anterior wall, the inferior wall, and also the lateral wall. So these are one of those LEDs you really don't want to lose. Here's a case of Wellens, okay? Here we go, woman with cardiovascular risk factors, chest pain, initial ECG, pretty benign, nothing. Uh, but then chest pain actually improves, surprisingly. And now you get these deep, deep precordial T waves. If you see, if you show anybody that, they may not know it's Wellens, but they'll know it's ischemic changes. This patient also has echo findings showing anterior wall, all similar here, just these trying to delineate the area here that's not feeding so well. Don't worry too much about that for now. Um, but here we go. And here again, this part of the wall is not beating well. So again, early presentation of NSTEMI. And like I said, with the, with the pig animal models, the ischemia causes a mechanical problem right away, not a mechanical complication, but the muscle is not beating right away. That is occurring real time. It's not just an electrical thing we see, it is actually occurring. And so right corner, it was fine. And sure enough, we have an occlusion. The left uh, LED is occluded here. Uh, here is where the occlusion is showing with this arrow and we're wiring it, trying to open it up and we do some ballooning and now we're starting to get flow. There's a lot of thrombus in this vessel, heavy thrombus burden. Here's a stent and deployed and we got revascularization. So again, Wellens T waves are what you see on EKG. Wellens, that's the Wellens sign. Wellens syndrome is, you know, patients basically having that waxing and waning presentation. And uh, final result, symptom resolution, all as well. So not all STEMIs are acute plaque ruptures. You can have vasospasm. You can have myocarditis, stress, cardiomyopathy, trauma, contusion. You can have other things like Brugada. Obviously, this talk is out. This is out of the scope for this talk. Uh, but we'll figure that out later. I'd rather cath them, and we call them FEMIs, fake STEMIs. So if you don't have any fake STEMIs, you're not going to the cath lab enough, right? And uh, the worst thing you want to do is turn something down that you think is a fake STEMI. I'm talking about me, and regret it severely in the morning when the troponin comes back 130. Um, so err on the side of, of cath. Here's a case of a 37-year-old man, shortness of breath, epigastric tenderness. So let's go through the algorithm here, localization. Okay, I'm starting to see some ST elevations in the anterior and lateral leads. Let me look over at the lateral leads. Okay, I'm seeing ST elevation a little bit in the lateral V1, lead one. So that's interesting. Is this an anterior STEMI? But wait, ST elevations also in the inferior leads? Something's going on. There's ST elevations everywhere. Well, when that happens, sometimes, and I've still seen a STEMI like this actually, where it's a huge LED that takes care of all of these territories, but you could also have pericarditis. So that's what this patient ends up having. Here we go. Um, and usually in AVR, you have a reciprocal change. So this is the case, young guy, fever, malaise, shortness of breath, diffuse ST elevation, consistent with pericarditis. And this is gonna show you a CT scan showing this pericardium is thick, very thick, nasty, nasty. Um, this is an echo and here's the pericardial fluid around it. Very thick, a lot of fluid. Uh, some this just uh, ignore this. This was more for like echo talk, but it's basically showing that the patient has not only a pericardial effusion, but they also have some restriction pericarditis. The pericardium is taut around the heart, and we are going to now basically tap this instead of taking them to the cath lab. This is the fluid. How nasty is this? It's full of neutrophils, pus basically around the heart. And he goes for surgery because it's a purulent drain, you know, basically rind around this heart. This is the surgeon's peeling off this nastiness. So again, originally called in as a STEMI, but the treatment is very different. Here's the pathology just showing that it's basically acute inflammation and from strep. This is a strep pericarditis, gross. I'm happy to say this patient actually had a very good recovery. And uh, this was a couple of years ago. Okay, so that's the diagnosis, localization. Sometimes we have cases that we think are STEMI that they're not. Uh, sometimes we have cases that we think are not that they are. But when all said and done, what do we do to manage acute coronary syndromes? Let's put out that fire. So the management is gonna be an assessment of how much risk they have, because that's gonna determine the speed and the comprehensiveness that we treat the patient. You're gonna to wanna to reduce the ischemia, reduce the thrombosis and improve the patient's pain. So, and then you're also gonna be on the lookout for complications. 
So the different things that you could use are correct the reversible causes, arrhythmia, such like that, nitrates, beta blockers. We'll not focus too much on this talk, but that's again to reduce the ischemia. And then you want to reduce, this is where, okay, we have the two football teams, the offense and the defense, and they're having this fight over the football, and it's time for the adults in the room to step in. We're going to be the referee. And to do that, we're going to give them aspirin. Aspirin's going to tell the player that's chill out, stop it, stop it. So it starts to tell the offensive players to cool off. Otherwise, they're going to, we're going to kill them off. So that's what aspirin is. Blood thinners also, because not only is the plug or the thrombus from aspirin, but it's also a bunch of protein things that come together and form the clot. And uh, the other form of a cousin of aspirin are these P2Y12 inhibitors. That's like Plavix, Berlinta, Lopetegrel, um, and Ticagrelor using trade names and real and the, and the real names. But the point is that the aspirin and the P2Y12 inhibitors are going to come and tell the platelets to chill out. And then the anticoagulants are going to tell the proteins that coagulate to chill out. And we will hopefully help the defense start to win. These are not clock busters. So it's not like we're, we ourselves are going to um, break up the clot, but we're allowing the body to break up the clot better. By slowing down the offense, we're going to give the leg up to the defense in this analogy. A cop, cop buster like streptokinos, TPA, that's different. And because we are close enough to you know multiple STEMI centers, we are not using that often. Um, we are going to rather you know invasive percutaneous intervention rather than the clot busters because PCI is more effective. But so that's the point. These medications here are really to slow down the offense so we can let the body's own defense take over. This is not so relevant for this conversation, but we're going to give blood thinners for the PCI. Not relevant. Uh, Ticagrelor, Prasigrel, and, and Clopidogrel are all of these P2I12 agents that can be given. But for you, it's aspirin. We will decide which antiplatelet to give. Uh, people are shifting to different ones. That's out of the scope of the practice. A lot of times we'll load the patient with Berlinta or Ticagrelor. That's our practice. That's the current guidelines. But uh, that's changing and not worth harping on right now. In the field, aspirin is great. And um, if you're not sure if the patient has taken aspirin, it's always it should be always okay to give more aspirin because the half-life of aspirin is actually really quick. Aspirin comes in and takes basically a huge dump on the platelets and then the aspirin itself leaves the body. So the effect of the platelets lasts for seven days, right? So, and that's because platelets, once they get poisoned by aspirin are poisoned, they're done. But it takes seven days to make new platelets, so to refresh the whole body's platelets. So if somebody got aspirin, the aspirin itself may now be out of the body, but the platelets are weakened for seven days. Whereas, um, whereas, uh, but if you're not sure if they, if they took aspirin or not, you're not going to overdose them by giving them another dose of the aspirin, because most likely the aspirin itself is out of the system. So... I always tell patients, when in doubt, just take the aspirin or like, you know, whatever, like we're cathing somebody, we're not sure if they got the aspirin. Don't perseverate too much. Just give them the aspirin and move on. Other things to help with the ischemia chain will be nitrates, morphine. Those are the kind of things. Um, and uh, we also, we want to reduce the chance of this occurring again. So we're going to give, make sure they're on high potency statins like Lipitor or atorvastatin, and we want to give them medications that help the heart remodel. That's for hospital care, not really the focus of the conversation today. We'll monitor them and do serial troponin ZKGs if it's not STEMI, um, and basically, but if it's acute coronary syndrome that's not STEMI, so it depends on the patient's situation. So for example, you have a patient that's in heart failure, you're going to want to go pretty quickly. If you have a patient that's, that's not in heart failure and chest pain free now, then you can take a little bit more time. So just a little, we already showed a lot of PCI, but here's an example, another case with the right coronary artery. So the catheter is here, we're injecting contrast in here, and you see there's an occlusion right over here. What you're not seeing is the rest of the vessel because the dye is not getting there. So that means if the dye is not getting there, then the blood is not getting there. And if the blood is not getting there, then the remainder of the territory that's supplied by this artery is going to be dying right now. Now, I will point out in this particular case, it's an inferior MI, so the inferior wall is, is, not, is impacted, but you can see these small branches here 
These are called acute marginal arteries. And I just want to tell you that they, they perfuse the right ventricle. So the right ventricle in this case is probably not going to be too sick, but the, the, the left ventricle inferior part is probably going to be sicker. That would be more in this area. So that's actually good because the patient may have a better blood pressure. If the occlusion were to have occurred earlier in the artery, then you would also not only lo would lose the aspect of the inferior wall of the left ventricle, but you can also take out the right ventricle. And that patient could be hypotensive. Those are the patients you're going to want to avoid no nitrates, and you're going to want to make sure their preload is good. The right ventricle is very, very responsive to fluid. So giving them fluid is going to be the way to go. And anything that makes the blood pool in the veins, like nitrates, sildenafil, nitro, all that stuff, that's going to make the patient much worse, very sensitive. But in this case, hopefully the patient's right ventricle is going to be okay. So we can come in, we can basically smush the plaque to the side or suck it out in certain cases. And what we do is we put, take a balloon, bring it in there, and on the balloon is going to be mounted a stent. The stent's going to be expanded, and that's going to shove the plaque to the side. It's a little bit of rotor rooter, and most of the time we're not sucking out the clot. These are what the stents look like. They're porous, save holes. And so if you have side branches that the stents can you know, cover, it's okay usually. And voila. I also want to point out, look, this is another case where there's two plaque ruptures. One is the complete and one is partial, like there versus here. So, uh, and now here's the final result. So we've stented from here and all the way down and we got a good result and then the inferior wall is now supplied. Notice these, these two acute marginal arteries were here now and they're also here before. That's going to impact that right ventricle. Here's an LED. We kind of showed this one earlier, mid-vessel occlusion. And uh, I just, this is not a STEMI, but I just wanted to show you what the ventricle looks like in angiography because it's, I think it's really cool and it's a great visual. So here is in a pigtail and it's injecting contrast. And you can see this ventricle is, this is the left ventricle and it's banging away and it's squeezing. So it's a cool visual of what that looks like. So this is the pump that's a, that keeps our body alive. It's really amazing. It's just hanging out here in the chest and it's just perfusing our body every second of every day. I, it's, I find this like, just like amazing. If you look closely here, you can see flapping of the aortic valve, but it might be hard on your screens. But anyways, this is the aorta bringing the blood flow around. Totally did not need to include this video, but I just can't stop looking at it uh, myself. So if your EKG shows STEMI, we know the answer. If the EKG does, shows no STEMI, further testing. Um, ST segment depression. Basically, if you have that, that could tell you that you're having ischemia. You could have ischemia from a clot that's not 100%, or you could have ischemia from something else entirely, say blood loss. So the other day I got called for a very gnarly looking EKG, and the person who was calling said, this patient is ischemic, and I agree with them. But I said, it's not a STEMI, so can we just get some labs? And sure enough, the patient's hemoglobin was like two. They were bleeding out of the rectum. So it was, it was ischemia, not because of a plaque rupture or anything like that, but it was ischemia from lack of oxygen because of lack of blood because of a bleeding problem. So taking that patient to the lab is a disaster. We're going to heparinize them and make the problem worse. So sometimes when it's not a STEMI, no, most of the time when it's not a STEMI, get more data. You will help minimize the risk of complications and maximize the amount of benefits of the patients who you do ultimately take to the cap lab. Um, so the last thing I'll point out is that just because it's not a full STEMI doesn't mean your patient isn't in big trouble. So here's a patient with tight left vein disease. They don't have a uh, STEMI, but their whole left main artery is hanging on by a thread. So here's an example. This patient presents with crescendo angina. It's a good story. And the troponin is not actually that high because there is flow, but there's very little flow. So you see here that this left main, this catheter is basically injecting and there's just a little bit of blood getting through here. So the whole heart is ischemic, but ultimately it's not because of um, a, full, a full occlusion. So again, this patient didn't have STEMI. We can optimize them. We can get their blood pressure better controlled. And then we can take them to the cath lab, identify this. And this patient did very well with um, bypass surgery. Here's another case. So again, demographics really help. You have a patient with... Um, you know, a 70 year old patient who smoked forever and has diabetes and uncontrolled and, you know, basically says they have chest pain. Okay, well, you know, you're highly suspicious, but you may have somebody that's different. A young woman passing out while gardening. That's weird. Okay, what does she have? This is her EKG and she goes into ventricular tachycardia. That's odd, but then she arrests. So she gets shocked. And what we can see here is 
this narrowing of her artery here. And this is basically a dissection. So not all things are plaque ruptures. Sometimes you can have a dissection in the artery and it's tracking down into this diagonal artery. This dissection is called spontaneous because it occurred by itself. It's spontaneous coronary dissection. They can be pretty subtle as in this case, but the same patient, again, because there's still a problem with blood flow, the heart, the heart knows what it knows and it knows that it's angry. And so it stops beating. So you can have a similar presentation, but it's not because of a plaque. The, the football analogy is not the issue, but rather it's because of um, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or the cool kids call it SCAD. And here's a CT scan, and you can see this narrowing. You have the left main and the narrowing of the LED. And here again, you can see this, uh, you can actually see the wall of the artery thickened. And this is just showing the wall of the artery has thickening to it because there's like basically blood within the wall of the artery. Um, I was working on some fancy graphics, that's what that was. This is a cardiac MRI, and it's also showing, it's gonna show basically the lateral and anterior wall of the heart not working. Again, not plaque rupture per se, but it's because here's the lineage. See this area is not working uh, as well. The anterior wall is just bowing out. It's scarred down. You can see that blackness there. So it's just, it's just highlighting that you can still have damage even though it's not an occurring occlusion. And so the treatment for SCAD is a little bit different than regular STEMI, but it's still worth coming to the emergency room right away. This patient ended up getting an ICD uh, because they had a VF on the field. And because we weren't able to reverse the SCAD process, so it was an irreversible cause of, SCAD, of uh, arrest. So they, they got an ICD placed. So this is what SCAD is. So you, you have the blood vessel that's smooth and nice, and then here you have a blood vessel that developed a hematoma inside. So you start to get narrowing of what we call the lumen. So you still have poor flow. You can have this flap that develops and uh, it can look similarly to F like an atherosclerosis, you know? So the patient's blood vessels still don't supply the right amount of blood. And so they have the same symptoms of ischemic pain, but it's not from thrombus and the treatments are gonna be different. Um, here's a really crazy case of a patient with SCAD and so her coronary artery, she has chest pain. Her coronary artery is fine. Um, her peak troponin is elevated, so she's got myocardial damage. And look here, this is going to highlight it, that the vessel like is fat and then becomes very thin and straggly and stringy. And that's because the whole artery has become dissected. And this is what's showing, like, this is what SCAD looks like on the EKG. It's just, a I mean, on the calf, it's just a diagnostic of it. Um, and you see it, it goes from fat to skinny. And so a blood vessel is even lost because of it. Anyways, the, the treatment for this is medical. We don't want to put wires into here because we can make it worse. So we try to avoid that. Um, but these are just showing you the, the, that what, what SCAD looks like. Not that you need to know per se, but to understand that the patients will present with ischemic change pain, they may not fit the regular demographic of a heart attack. And here you could see another V-gram that I showed you earlier, but what you could see is that there's actually a thrombus because the ventricle wall is not squeezing well, blood is pooling there. That's how bad this ventricle is not working. And this thrombus, which is this you know empty spot over here, can, God forbid, go to the brain as a stroke. So a real consequence with a coronary problem, but not from thrombotic. So don't let the history totally make you think away from an acute coronary syndrome is the point of these last two cases. So these are SCAD points that we don't have to time or need to go over right now, but there are certain triggers. There are certain demographics that are more likely to have this. Like the classic is going to be a woman who's postpartum and then comes in with chest pain. That's classic, classic, classic. Um, here's a case where the patient has chest pain and they have these weird, big, very big uh, T waves. So they almost look like well in waves actually. And so you might think that this is ischemia and it actually is not ischemia. This is what's called stress cardiomyopathy or Takasubo. But as I told you, well ins T waves signify LAD ischemia. So you cannot say from this EKG that this patient doesn't have ischemia. And so it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to first exclude ischemia. Usually we do it by the cath lab. And when you see that the arteries look great, then you could say this patient has stress cardiomyopathy. Stress cardiomyopathy is a phenomenon that we have recently realized in the last couple of decades. And it's basically, it mimics a heart attack. The patient legit sounds like they're having a heart attack, but the arteries are fine. And they have these weird EKG changes and wall motion abnormalities. So I've shown you these echoes over and over and over today. And you don't have to be an echo reader, but they're all showing the similar pattern of the LAD territory. So you have LAD territory that's not working well, but it's a phenomenon not due 
to the large blood vessels. It's a heart attack fake out. And we're happy to rule out heart attack and show that the patients have stress, cardiomyopathy, or Takotsubo because it recovers very well. And so the patients, well, first of all, it's really weird, but as soon as I tell the patients that they feel well, a lot of them, I would say like 90% will feel well. It's like there's some psychological component. This is a brain heart connection that when they know that it's not a heart attack, they actually feel better right away. But there's a lot of objective things going on, like these echo findings, these EKG findings. So it's a kind of diagnosis that you know, you find out, but it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You still got to rule out the ischemia. Uh, here's just another other echo showing that like the heart function is not so great in this apical part, but it's better in this other part. Again, this apical part of the heart is really the LAD territory. So it mimics an LAD heart attack, but it's just not. It's so weird. This is a graphic that we put together uh, about tackling Takasubo, the different reasons and causes and thoughts about it. Not for now, but you can find these kinds of things on cardionerds.com. Shameless plug. Uh, where we have a lot of resources. So it's 8.30. We've been talking for an hour and a half. So I think it's a good time for it to conclude the talk and raise the openness for questions. So STEMI management for EMS providers, recognize it. You are the first link in the chain. If you're not there, we don't see them. If we don't see them, the heart attack doesn't stop. It just goes. So early recognition and activation, uh, you know, basically you see the stat, you know, get hit those metrics, race each other, get those EKGs real fast and get that timely activation. Give the aspirin. That's the defensive team. You know, basically give a give a one up to the defense. Take out that offense a little bit with the aspirin. Rapid transport. Time is muscle. Communication is so important. If we have a good story from the field, like it does, it does wonders. We're like ready. You know, our team has got to be there in 30 minutes. So as soon as you activate, we're out there, we're on the road, we're listening to our Metallica, we're pumped, we're ready to be there. You know, if we know that this patient is hypotensive as an anterior MI and was clutching their chest, you know, like we're going to still get there as soon as possible, but we now are armed with a lot of information. This patient needs reperfusion immediately. So your story really, really helps us. And the advanced care, basically get them and be aware that this patient may develop arrhythmias, hemodynamic instability, and let's get them to a place where if you can provide the care that supports their blood pressures, that they don't fall into this like, you know, cycle of doom, let's do it. And ongoing education is just really important. Keep getting up abreast in the semi, you know, it's always, it's always uh, fun to see new patterns. You know, medicine is, uh, we gotta be humble. We're gonna see new patterns. Things trick you. I've had cases where I was like, Sure, it was pericarditis, but the emergency room doctor had this alarm in their in their you know in their voice, and I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna stick to my guns. I'm gonna cat the patient, and I'm calling the emergency room doctor and just thanking them a hundred times over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've had cases where EMS provided an ECG and uh, and uh, it was questionable, but the ECG was like the the provider said, no, this is I'm telling you, this is true ACS. Sure enough, another ten minutes later, a, a ECG CG clocks in a legit STEMI, but we're already on the road. So we're always learning. And uh, that goes, that's mutually uh, between all of us in the pre-hospital and post-hospital care of STEMI. So that's all I got in the talk, but feel free to shoot the shit, talk to Breeze, uh, ask any questions you want. I'm happy to discuss anything that you want to talk about if I know about it. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. All right. If you could start writing your questions in the chat for Dr. Ambender. Um, I just want to make one comment that this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. Some of you know, most of you don't, but in a little bit of detail. Um, 875 days ago, I was out jogging. No problems, came home, went out, got pizza, bought the pizza home. And then I remember waking up a week later, uh, I had an acute cardiac arrest. Uh, CPR was started by squad 322, I believe. Um, I was placed on a Lucas. I had 36 minutes of CPR, 10 defibrillations, lots of epi. I was taken to the Sinai. Uh, we bypassed the ER. They took me straight to the cath lab with the Lucas on. Um, I had a PCI. They found the blood clot in my left a main. I was then put on ice, I guess, for about a week. Uh, and then I woke up. We are now 100, well, we're now 875 days later. Um, 
my EF is normal, my everything is normal uh, because of the intervention of of you guys. Uh, here I am today, and I can't stress what Dr. Amender said enough. Uh, it saves lives. I think I might have been beat your record just from what I can tell time wise, but I'm okay with it. Uh, at least from what I can see. Uh, but the cath labs can do amazing things, but they have to know. And to summarize what he said, early phone calls, call 911. I didn't call 911. I don't remember anything in all honesty. <laughs> I don't even know who did. Uh, but um, CPR, ambulance gets there, recognize it, early defibs, aspirin, oxygen, transport, transport, transport. Let them know, let them have the team in. Somebody called the team for me. They were there prior to my arrival. And there you go. So it works. It works very well in my very biased opinion. Those guys didn't know that before we had this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so questions. Dr. C, that's an incredible story. And I'm so glad to hear that you, uh, you uh, stayed away from the pearly gates and are hanging out with us still. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't remember anything at all. I don't remember 24 hours before the event. I don't remember the first week after. Um, people ask me, what did you see? I didn't see squat. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I was denied. Uh, I did have a little bit of fun when I back to the hospital, a bunch of people seeing me. I was like, you're here. I thought you were dead. And then I said, you can see me? Really? Wow. So I had to have a little bit of that. But um no, this is this is the, the, the secret to success. This is what we do. This is what you do. It's what we all do with a common goal. And fortunately I'm proof positive. <laughs> and here I am riding the engine, riding the squad, riding the ambulance, going back to work and uh taking care of people. So this is great. I think this is a wonderful way to start the series out for the year. Uh, I'm going to invite you guys back in another year, just so you know, just to save time. <laughs> Got the present. I think you guys amazing things. Um, I don't see too many other um, conversation questions in the in the uh, the chats, but I mean, it was um, this was a uh, this was amazing. This was very well. This was done. Uh, there is a question now. Wellen syndrome, does pain come and go over minutes or sooner or longer? I think somebody's Tom Gilbert is interested in Wellen syndrome a little bit if you want to comment on it. Yeah, so it's usually, I, it's uh, that I'm not actually sure about because every patient is a little bit different and it will go with the dynamics of it. But I what we'll find is uh, the, the, you may find it differently than we do. But the way we find it is the patient comes to the emergency room with chest pain and when they get to the emergency room, they're chest pain free. And then the EKG that's shown is the Wellens T wave. That's the one that we'll see first. So I don't know if they had STEMI in the field that got better. Um, so it's not usually dynamic, like, um, like, like uh, it's not, it, it can be, but it's not necessarily like off and on within the same hour, if that makes sense. Because what's usually happening is that they got reperfusion and now they feel better. And then their, you know, their body sort of like, with every platelet that gets added, another platelet gets removed. So they're sort of in the steady state. But I don't know if uh, you, uh, Dr. Zadel, you've, you've seen differently. Um, usually if we get called to the cath lab, it's uh, they've already arrived and um, we're, uh, we're intubating them because they refuse to hold still for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I always remember when I uh, started out, for in, in, in med school, they said there was uh, three things to say a person had an MI. You had to have history, you had to have EKG changes, and you had to have enzymes. And then, unless you're diabetic, <laughs> then you only need two of the three. <laughs> so, but the bottom line is, don't guess, just transport and find out. Just take them and let the ER figure it out. Um, it's interesting, they're starting to look now at, um, and you're gonna see it in Maryland, more with um, 
you know, the, the, the cath labs. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if there's going to be 24 hour attended cath labs soon or not. But also taking more cardiac arrest or developing protocols and criteria for situations such as mine, where you're in cardiac arrest with a Lucas on, and if you meet certain criteria, bypass the ER and go straight to the cath lab. So we'll see how that goes. But that's starting now. Uh, that's that stuff. Those those are pilot programs, and it's 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 out there. So, but it's all good. It's all good news. Somebody asked about the SC. Why is it a rise on the EKG? Um, so thanks for asking that, Robert G. So um, the, it has to do with the vectors of the injury and current of injury. And uh, I remember learning this in like medical school and like trying to wrap my head around it. Uh, it is like very complex and it has to do with like the vectors of the way the electricity emits from the muscle. But if you want to think about it this way, so when you, when you have your, I don't know if you can see my face. Yeah, you can see my hands. Okay, so like if my hand is the ball of my, my fist is the heart. The coronary arteries run around the outside of the heart. So they provide blood vessels that go through into the heart, like little small arterioles that bring blood flow to the inside of the heart. So the last, the furthest thing away from the coronary arteries is the inner lining of the heart or the endocardium, the inside. So that's the inside of my hand here. So when the heart, when the coronary is not 100% blocked, but only 90% blocked, and there's not enough blood flow getting to the heart, but you're not enough to cause the entire thickness of the heart to die. The first thing that will start to get ischemic or damage is the inner lining of the heart. That's this. So the analogy that I'll give to my patients is the blood flow, like my hand turns white, right? So that's just the inner lining, but my whole hand didn't necessarily die, just that inner lining. So when those inner linings are the only thing that becomes ischemic, but the rest of the heart wall, thinking now of the thickness of my heart, is fine, then the, the injury, current of injury on the surface ECG is negative, so it's down. When the entire artery is occluded, and now instead of just like half of the wall or just the inside of the lining of the wall, the entire thickness of the wall is ischemic, then the depolarization is in the direction that's positive or basically coming towards the lead. And for whatever reason, that that's a molecular reason or whatever that I can't really explain here, but, but that's the differentiation between the subendocardial ischemia that you get the SD depressions versus the myocardial infarction through thickness of the heart that you get a full, full wall death. That's the difference. No problem. Well, for those who would like uh, MIMS uh, continue and ed credit, the link is up near the top in the chat at this point. Um, please fill that out. Uh, any suggestions for topics, please send it in. We're in the process of filling in our speaker series between September and uh, July of next year. So everything I assure you is looked at and we, we, we try. I mean, there's lots of topics we want to cover. So yeah, take credit and then and please give suggestions. Again, thank you very, very much. This was a fantastic talk. Um, it will have an impact. Uh, lots of people will be taking this back with them to the field. It's going to be available for other people to see who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, it is, this is really cool stuff, I think, um, but I'm biased. <laughs> Well, thank you all for all that you do. You're really the backbone of uh, the community. You're out there helping people find their way to where they need to find. We cannot tell you how grateful we are when um, we see those numbers that Jen showed earlier. I mean, that is the true uh, uh, success. Patients really, really, a lot of times do not know where to go and they call you for help and you help them get to the right place fast. It makes all of the difference. The same artery, like I said earlier, uh, fix today, fix tomorrow, is the patient's just gonna have a completely, completely different different experience. So uh, 
definitely you can check us out for cardinals.com, but you can also um, text if you ever have any questions. My number's in the chat. You can also email me if you want. My number, my email's in the chat. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you in a few more minutes. All right. Welcome back.